All right, how about we look at some of the areas of, in this case, together but not married. Now, this is to do with cohabitation. And in Canada, cohabitation is increasingly accepted among younger people. The common law union is a union of two partners in a lasting relationship resembling marriage. In 2011, 2.8 million Can Canadians um, age 16 with parental uh, permission and older uh, were, in co were in cohabitation. It makes up about 15.4% of all census families. Uh, that proportion has doubled over the last two decades. For cohorts born before 1960, now cohorts would be that if you would imagine to break it up every 10 years, then everybody in a cohort would be everybody born in that 10 year period. So people who were from the 60s, the proportion of cohabitating couples is also increasing. This suggests that many people are choosing to cohabitate instead of remarrying after divorce or widowhood. So it's taking up a bigger place than it used to take. Now, Canadians generally view cohab cohabitation as the prelude to marriage rather than the substitute for it. A notable exception, of course, as I've mentioned before last week, is in Quebec, where they, many believe that common law is a distinct alternative to, ma to marriage. I think it's the largest, uh, the population with the largest percentage of cohabitating couples at 38%. Uh, no other province in Canada has that higher rate of cohabitation. Federally, those living together for one year can receive couple benefits. Now that will vary from uh, province to province, but that's the federal guideline. However, each province sets their own conditions for common law status. Common law union can be, the, can be same or opposite sex does not make a difference for legal purposes. Often cohabitating couples don't have the same property rights as married couples though. In some ways, cohabitation and marriage are alike. Both involve romantic relationships, pooled incoming and expenses, children rearing, and the benefit of emotional support, but there are some differences. Marriage tends to be more permanent. There's no waiting period for legal rights or responsibilities to apply as they as when uh, couples live common law and common law is not governed by the same social expectations the cost of leaving are seen as lower than marital separation or divorce and people who had romantic relationships and sexual intercourse younger are more likely to cohabitate now if we carry on and look at continued variations we can see as an example uh, same-sex uh, couples and same-sex couples uh, has been legalized. Um, it's legalized and it's seen as more socially acceptable. In fact, the idea of, of um, a same-sex marriage really wasn't a huge problem for Canadians. It really ended up being more of an economic issue around how would we, you know, how would the government of Canada and its uh, pay for the supports, you know, for uh, pension plans and such for people who are otherwise weren't legally able to marry. Before 2005, 49% of Canadians supported it. In 2009, 61% of Canadians supported same-sex marriage. Some family members who were opposed to support were more inclined to, inclined to if the couple were legally married. Until 2005, although same-sex couples had gained many of the same rights as cohabitators, they had no further um, stage possible in their relationship because they were not allowed to marry. Same-sex couples choose marriage for the same reasons as heterosexual couples do. Uh, an opportunity to create family through adoption, to automatically care for a partner in case of illness or injury, and to act on other legal matters. Now when we think about marital happiness, when we enter a relationship, we bring our personality, our past history with us. Sex role identity appears to be associated with adjustments in marriage. A decline in traditional gender roles is related to um, a greater marital happiness. So getting away from clear-cut gender roles increases the likelihood of a better marriage. Uh, partners who are emotionally healthy have higher levels of empathy. Interpersonal skills are more and more accurately interpret the message of their partner that their partner is sending. This underlies the importance of communication, of establishing and maintaining a level of high level of communication to support 
the first developmental task of intimacy. Relationship style of couples is related to both problem solving and marital satisfaction. Perception of partners is also important in how we see one another. Spending a long time talking, however, does not necessarily mean that a couple's communication is effective. Nonverbal communication be, may be more important than uh, what each partner actually says. So the things that we do, the way we express, that if we look like we're moping and pissed off and um, our partner asks us how are we and we say we're fine, clearly we're not and it's better to cross the line and speak up and talk about it than it is to ignore it. Effective communication depends on continued use of maintenance strategies being positive or helpful when one par partner is tired or angry or otherwise negative. Disagreement in marriage is probably reduced by homogamy. Verbal disagreements tend to be higher when a couple is having troubles in their marriage. It's not too surprising, but then let's look at some of the variables that influence marital happiness. Individuals have you know, each of us have our own different conflict styles that the most successful in dealing with differences are those who de-escalate conflict instead of feeding anger. Those who trade anger for anger are more likely to set off a vicious cycle. The balance between conflict and pleasant aspects of marriage is also important. It's not that you can avoid anger, it's that learning how to deal with it in a responsible, positive way to dissipate it and move forward so that doesn't have to be a, a constant cycle of anger. Every negative interaction should be balanced by four or five positive ones. This is an interesting point in that it's the same kind of point that we talk about when we, when we talk about parenting and with children. Every negative interaction with a child should be offset by at least four or five positive ones. Extended family members can have an important impact on couples' marital happiness. Relatives of gay and lesbian individuals may accept or reject their child and his or her partner. Couples who live in areas in high levels of welfare and poverty may suffer from more chronic stress. So when we think again about you know, what other elements influence marital happiness, studies have shown that levels of happiness are highest in their early marriage. Rising at the first birth of a child and dropping with teenagers in, in the family and increasing when children leave home and couples live without them. However, happiness never reaches, never reached the high in the early on in the relationship. And that's a key piece to, to note is to expect that the marriage is going to maintain the same emotional high at first in early marriage than you know, all the way through is, is a, bit mis, a bit of a misunderstanding. It's about trying to understand the emotional variability of a marriage and find the happiness at each stage. Other studies have found that happiness declines over time. However, the amount of decrease is related to the couple's happiness at the beginning of the research. Factors related to drop in marital satisfaction when children are in the home. Birth of the first child usually experiences a high and in many ways is similar to the honeymoon. New parents, however, soon need to face the realities of the day-to-day -day living with an infant. Demands of a new child puts on parents can affect their relationship with interrupted sleep, the amount of time needing to be spent caring for a child that doesn't seem to be focused on one another. Conflicts over child rearing, the differences in permissiveness or the who does more work, the presence of children significantly influences decisions about who works and where families live. Factors related to uh, drop in marital satisfaction when teenagers are in the home, parents have children who keep adult hours which limits privacy. The strain can result when parents disagree on how to deal with the challenges of teenagers' presence. Uh, children may also impose financial strain if they go to post-secondary education and once children leave home couples have to adjust to living without children again frequently they must rebuild common interests if the individual and his or her social uh, group condemns infidelity less likely infidelity is more likely the opportunity for an undiscovered encounter that presents itself there are several criticisms of the life cycle view of marital satisfaction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of these are based on the fact that surveys are conducted by asking people by different ages about their feelings rather than following the same couple over many years. <clears throat> it may be also that some couples are more uh, who are older report happiness uh, than couples uh, who are younger. Now types of marriages, there's a variety of types 
And you're seeing an image here of several varieties. And this is work that's been done by Lavallee and Olson from 1933, 1993, sorry, where they collected data on 8,383 heterosexual married couples and measured the spouse's evaluation of their relationship along nine dimensions. These dimensions included personality issues, communication, conflict resolution, financial management, leisure activity, sexual relationship, children and parenting, family and friends, and religious correlations. Then they divided the, the, the research resor um, uh, results into seven types of marriages. They have devitalized, financially focused, conflict, traditional, balanced, harmonious, and vitalized. These are just different types of marriage. What's interesting about these types and other research that's along this line is that this is what is successful in those people's, as they describe in their marriages. These aren't necessarily examples of poor marriages. These might be more examples of good, um, happy for them, even though you might look at it and go, hmm, that wouldn't make me very happy. Now, not all marriages are successful. Not all marriages work out well. And we find that there are examples of infidelity in relationships. And this is involving sex outside a committed relationship. Ranges from one night stands to long term relationships. Um, can be only sexual, only, uh, can be only sexual, only emotional, or it can be a combination of both sexual and emotional. Interaction with the internet lover may lead to emotional withdrawal from a partner. Men are more likely to be unfaithful. Though recent studies show rates for men and women are becoming more alike. For men, being married or cohabitating has no significant effect in predicting infidelity. Married women are less likely to be unfaithful. More highly educated people are more likely to report engaging in infidelity. So being smart doesn't necessarily make you better at marriage. Infidelity is the single most cited cause of divorce. <clears throat> Cohabitators are more likely to be married um, cohabitators are more likely to more likely than married to part to go their separate ways uh, can result in rage loss and trust fear lower self-esteem men are more likely to be angry and jealous over sexual aspects women likelier to be jealous over emotional aspects and that's a very high um, generalization now married happiness throughout the life if you're gonna have happiness what helps it well, when marriage encounters rough times, other factors become important. First is commitment. When commitment is not enough, forgiveness becomes important in repairing a, mar a marriage, especially when there have been serious betrayals such as infidelity. Scholars have also identified satisfaction as a factor in some long-lasting marriages. The marriage has been seen as having a higher purpose. Um, it's not to say that every problem that exists in a, in, a, in, a, in a marriage for every couple can be resolved with forgiveness. But if the commitment to the relationship was what's important, one, some of these problems don't exist, and that if some of these problems do exist, um, finding a solution where at some point forgiveness will be a part of that solution can secure a relationship over the long haul. Happily married throughout life is not something that's easily done. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of other issues that involves in relationships that contribute uh, to making long-lasting, lifelong marriages successful. So we look at to the future. Does marriage have a future? Well, statistically, marriage is on the decline. Likely the result of delayed marriages, people getting married later, partly because of tighter economic times, partly because of increased cohabitation before marriage. Another view is that marriage is changing to meet the needs of a changing society, moving from patriarchal, husband-led systems to something more egalitarian. Same-sex marriages is, likely to undermine, uh, is unlikely to undermine marriage as a whole. Cohabitation, because of so many couples involved, has had and probably we will have a significant impact on marriage because of the value is still placed on marriage it will likely survive well i hope this has been a helpful chapter for you i hope there's some interesting points and and um, 
questions you might have. So um, we're done for this particular week and I hope that um, you get yourself ready for, I believe we have a test coming up. So please prepare and good luck. We'll see you later. Bye now.